My name's Jennifer Nichols and I'm from the Australian Institute of Architects and we produce Open House Hobart here in Tasmania. Um, great, privilege, great privilege to welcome you here to um, Dorney House. Beautiful views across Hobart. Firstly, I'm proud to respectfully acknowledge the original traditional custodians of this land, the Lutruwita people and elders past and present. Um, we're here at an Esmond Dorney house and we're very fortunate we've actually got his son, Paddy Dorney, here who's going to show us through. So come with me. Hey Paddy, how you doing? Uh, lovely to see you Jen, oh, as okay. always. Thank you so much for meeting us here and oh, showing us through. Nice to come home. <laughs> so as some of you may know, this is actually Paddy's family's um, original home. There's a few reiterations of that, but we're going to get Paddy to show us through now. All right. Yeah, this is the third house. Uh, we're pretty good at losing houses to fire. I'll tell you a story about it as we go. It's built on an old fort. Uh, 1904 to keep the Russians out, but the Russians never came. Um, so let's call it a folly. Um, it was only once ever fired in anger. They had two big six inch guns and it was fired at the Americans. Donald Trump wasn't even president. <laughs> <laughs> now, underneath we'll see the bunkers. This is the big magazines uh, that used to feed the big guns. The houses are actually built on the gun emplacements, the big circular round concrete, and they made the floor of the original building and they're still the foundation of the original building because Esmond always respects the past. It's not something you remove. And you'll find that because the stairs, one of the sets of stairs we're walking up is from the second house, which burnt down in 1978. It survived the fire and they're kept in the new building, even though they don't direct. The new building is nothing like the old building. Uh, everything gets burnt. And at the height of the fire, excuse me, very exciting. Looking at, at the height of the fire, my mother and father uh, we got, uh, it was a bush burning and they were sheltering these underground bunkers that run right back under the house. You could hear the house burning over their heads. And I was away working on the West Coast at the time. I finally got in touch with my mum three days later and said, look, you know, how's the great man? His house burns. He must be upset. And she said, at the height of the fire when we were sheltering in the bunker in here, uh, underneath the house and listening to it burn, he'd found a piece of paper and a pencil. He was sketching what he was going to do next. <laughs> He was 72 then. Yeah. Always looking to the future. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say So these stairs are uh, the original one from the fort uh, in 1907, I think. And Esmond, who was a pilot, has this flight metaphor and he uses this compression and opening. So this next set of stairs he built, this is the stairs for the second house and now the third house. And as you can see, they float. And the idea is that you're getting compression. And the metaphor is that when you're a pilot and you fly through clouds, it compresses you down and then you come out of the clouds and the world opens up to you. And Esmond plays this game in much of his architecture in compressing you on, on entrance, as Frank Lloyd Wright did. Uh, and as uh, Alto did and whatever, they do this incredible uh, journeys that actually change the way you see before you even get in the building. So the inside and the outside are actually as important as each other. A little bit of a view here, and as you will see when you get up into the house, there's a lot more and it opens to you. So, and then we lose the view, walking up the stairs, and we are flying through cloud in metaphor. We're compressed again in this tiny little entrance space. And then the world opens the deeper we go into the building. Uh, and this is all our secrets. Oh, we've got flares. Hello. Deep into the building. As you go further in, you'll see the view opens out. So from deep to the southwest in the south, Bruni Island, right up into the central highlands and the city uh, to the north. And the house is interesting because it's focused on the fireplace. It's a traditional metaphor. It was true of all three houses. Desmond probably invents the conversation pit, uh, the modern one. Um, well, of course, they had them in Bronze Age houses and they actually had them in the men's houses in Malaya and Java, where he just been in the 
previous few years before we built the first house. So a bit of cross-cultural borrowing. And the idea is that the family uh, and the community and the friends, we had lots of visitors. We had balls here every year, lots of parties, gather about the fire uh, and share terrible stories, some of which are even true. <laughs> and a lot of whiskey and a lot of beer. Uh, so it was a place for family to come together. The circular table in the middle, which carried food, and everyone sat around either on the seats or on the floor. Uh, at balls, we had up to 150, 200 people here uh, for a ball every year, or you can sit in here on your own. There aren't many spaces, I think, in architecture where you could be comfortable sitting in there on your own and equally comfortable with 150 people. Um, it's quite extraordinary, and it's partly because the view is actually the dominant aspect. This idea of this house is not necessarily a place to be seen, spectacular as it is from outside, it's not, that's a result of the structure. It's intended to look from, it's a machine for seeing rather than a place to be seen, I think. Uh, I think this is a really strong idea. You'll find it in much of Esmond's post-war architecture. Um, and it's a very different way of looking at the world. What it gives you is a new way of looking at the world. Uh, up here, the foreground's been removed uh, because it falls below the house, and we've got mid-ground and distant ground, and it's like watching from Olympus or, uh, you know, it's, it's almost godlike, and I don't mean that in any arrogant sort of fashion. It's because you're removed, um, you become an objective viewer rather than a subjective viewer, and it gives you a new way to look at uh, the landscape and the panorama. And that's interesting because I think on this hill, the core, some of Dad's best friends were guys like Denny King from Bathurst Harbour and Port Davey, uh, Phil Tapping, uh, who, Pierre Tapping, sorry, who was uh, head of the Hydro's exploration arm. Uh, he was my godfather, actually. Uh, Jack Waits, who was one of the great bushwalkers of the state, and out of those parties were people sitting around the fireplace, drinking whiskey and telling stories, I think grew much of the Tasmanian Green Movement. This is the, even before the UTG formed, the world's first green political party was formed in Tasmania. And yet architecture can bring people together and give them the opportunity to change ideas. It's a lovely idea that architecture actually has a function beyond merely shelter. I don't mean merely shelter, it's a wonderful thing to have shelter. But, um, but in fact, this metaphor of the circle face around the fire, the campfire, if you like, is a coming together space for the people, as it probably was for the Aboriginal people that we've just uh, been welcoming you to their land, because it was once their land. And it's interesting because on the top of the hill here as a kid growing up, I often found relatively fresh seashells. Now we're nearly 640 feet in the air, uh, straight up a very steep hill. And when you think about how they got here, it was quite obvious that uh, the Aboriginal community who were here before settlement came up for the same reason we did, because the view is wonderful and they brought lunch. <laughs> um, so I think there's a strong connection to my country, which is this, where I grew up, and their country in Australia in the same way. I think it gives me some understanding of the strong Aboriginal position and their connection to land, I think. Uh, and this house is beautifully like that. As you can see, there are a series of spaces. They're separated by levels, uh, changes, largely. It's designed to have almost no furniture. And they all had names. This was the lounge, that was the sunroom, uh, that was the dining uh, room. And they're largely defined by the level changes and the passage of the sun and the moon. The quality of light is what draws you to the space and it's intended to. So you're used to the different times of the day for different purposes. Uh, so it's really very much about your experience of the real world, this house. Unlike most houses which put walls up between you and the real world and you retreat into them, uh, this house is about operating with the real world as it happens, and yet giving you an objective position where you feel removed from it, strangely, which gives you a new place to look at the world and change your ideas on. Anyway, welcome to the Dorney House. So I think we're ready to run out of time. How are we doing, Jen? No, we're doing well. We've oh, come good. here to well, press through. You got questions? No, no, through more of the house oh, because yeah, like, this is obviously that very communal um, space where you welcome friends and entertained and all 
um, you know, enjoyed each other's company. But then there's some other spaces within the building that I think everyone's really interested to see, Patty, so we'd love you to show us through. Well, it's intriguing that this space here, as you can see, is open to the rest, was my mother's bedroom. And here she had a bed which actually folded down and became something you could sit on. It wasn't actually a couch during the day. And she would wake up to sunrises over here as goes the moon, straight in her window, and it was just extraordinary. And this was our sense. We didn't have neighbours, so we didn't have curtains and we didn't have blinds. Um, Dad always said if someone's weird enough to stay in the bushes to see me walking naked to the shower, then they really need help. Um, <laughs> so we, we were brought up in glass houses and, and we weren't overly conscious of such things. Um, and for us, it was a matter of sharing it with the landscape and the environment around us, and that's what we grew up with. My mum would feed rabbits out the window. She'd call the rabbits and throw out oats, and the rats used to hop up and pretend to be rabbits, rabbits still, I think. Uh, and we lived with it. The birds or bird tails were being fed here, so we were surrounded by wildlife. Not all of it native, but a lot of it was. Um, and we lived to it. We'd drive home every night and see lots of native animals on the road, uh, alive in our case. Uh, you know, bandicoots and uh, wallaby eventually. We didn't have any in the early days. Native cats. Uh, lots of animals here. Swift. Parrots are common here, a lot of pardalotes, uh, a lot of green rosellas. It was a kid's paradise, if you liked animals and plants, yeah. which I've grown up doing. So, which is just as well as we didn't have many neighbours. I didn't have too many people to play. <laughs> Lots of animals too. What's through here, Patty? Small thing here is a small bathroom and toilets, but interesting levels. I mean, look at that. <laughs> we never had a curtain. This was a toilet with a view. <laughs> And you can look in as much as look out, but honestly, when we don't have neighbours, it's not a big issue. And there's some other intriguing things about the building. My father's bedroom is in the way, he's much older than the time this is built, he's in his yeah. 70s. And he's probably needing to go you know, to the bathroom a few times a night, and he's not that comfortable with, so he's built himself his own little retreat. And when we have lots of visitors, as my mum done, she's, she's quite younger than him. Uh, he likes to hide away there, so he built himself a little retreat off here. It's intriguing for one reason, because we lost two houses to fire, or one by the time Dad had died, and the tram. And uh, I was overseas while this was built. I was in Central America and North Africa. And when I got in, I said to my dad, what do you reckon about this one, Dad? He says, I'll tell you one thing, son. He says, this bastard won't burn. <laughs> but here's the secret. When he built his own, um, I think we might. Oh, you go this way. It's a bit difficult. Can you manage that? He hides himself away. It's a little retreat when we have visitors. This is Dad's bedroom. Now, the whole house is fireproof. It's steel, it's concrete, it's glass, nothing to burn. The ceilings are actually steel. A little bit of plywood panelling, which is beautiful. And this, if you look at the windows, Timber frame, he just couldn't in his own space bring himself to do everything <laughs> fireproof and whatever because he loved timber. And so his own space, this is the only timber frame windows in the building. Uh, mm -hmm. That's how much he cared for timber. You can see it inside with the panelling, the plywood panelling. It has perfect acoustics. In the second house we had here, we used to have a quadraphonic sound system. Uh, we've got a concert tonight. We've done a number of concerts here. You may have seen the opening one for uh, Open House this year. And it has almost perfect acoustics. You can perform in here without any amplification. It's quite extraordinary. Dark again. Deep dark, sorry. This was my bedroom. They built it for me in the vain hope I'd come home from overseas, which I did eventually. And I think the honeymoon lasted for about two weeks and my mother walked in one morning as I was lying in here with a hangover, staring at that fantastic view. Yeah. Threw the newspaper on the bed and said, and the jobs are on page 15. <laughs> so I wasn't here that long, but uh, it's a very special place to wake up, as you can see. There's extraordinary view and that's all parkland. It's not going to get built out. So, Patty, maybe because we do have a little bit more time, you could take us outside and show oh, okay. us a little bit. Yeah, we could get a look at the garden placement at the far end. Oh, that would be really great. exciting. Beautiful. 
because that explains them all. Why we, why we have a secular house? Or radio, as Dad would have called it. Water was always an issue in the second house, and you can see Dad never resolves from it. A tank is something to celebrate. We had a tank that was four times the height of this in the second house. It was just this big sculptural element that was by the house. It was beautiful. I still find tanks beautiful to this day for some strange reason. This was the observation room where the army boys, when they were firing the big guns, the officers all hid in here in case the Russians came and shelled us. So the guys on the guns would get shot, but they'd be fine. <laughs> it had one of the first telephones in Tasmania uh, connecting it to the top of uh, the mountain beside us and to the gun emplacements along the river. This is why we're bothering to come down here. This is the gun emplacement for the big guns. There is one under the house we've just seen and one under this. This was the original site of the first house, our little glass house. And the gun emplacement was actually the floor. Uh, just after the war, materials were hard to come by. Uh, I grew up in this little house, uh, burnt down in 98, I think. And if you look into it, you can see the big bolts that held down the big six inch gun. It could fire about 12 kilometers. Unfortunately, uh, the Russians, the Japanese and the English all had guns that could fire about 20 kilometers. And they could sit offshore and shell you here. I think it was a bit outmoded from, from the first. So dad turns up after what was an interesting war, actually. Uh, he was working behind Japanese lines in Java. Uh, interesting enough to not have much of an opinion of authority. Um, and turns a military installation, a place with big guns, into something extraordinary. Dad often did this in his architecture. What he does is invert an idea. So here's the military, which is all about control and dominance of the river. And he turns it into something that's all about the view of the river and a home, a family home. So from domination out, it becomes community and family in. So he turns the military into a house. I think it's a lovely idea. It's a lovely metaphor. Uh, and you can see that in his strong focus on community and gathering about the fire as you saw in that house and this house was much the same this was probably the world's first conversation pit in modern things i can't find an american one before 1952 this was built in 1948 uh, so in the big circle where the gun sat there was a suspended timber floor uh, a fireplace once again on the far side and then this was a glass ring uh, if you look closely here See these black marks here? That's the melted glass from the house. And so that's where the ring of glass that surrounded this. So it was a perfect glass house. I did throw stones, but not inside. <laughs> um, it was built originally to be temporary. Uh, Dad was always going to build on the northern gun emplacement, as you've seen in the last house we've got there. And it was temporary, and he did build on it. It took him 17 years. So for 17 years, it was temporary. And it was still, to the end of her days, my mother's favourite. Tiny little house, just in glass, almost impossible. This tiny little area here was the whole kitchen, and she used to cook for 20. <laughs> and she loved it, um, as you would. I'd up your kids and everything in it. We lived with the birds that surrounded the house. It was just beautiful. She did love the other houses, but she never forgot living in this little house. So it worked for us. I did have a woman when she was visiting a year or two ago come up to me in the other house and say, look, Patty, that house is lovely. Yeah, I said, but I could never live here it's before I'd moved out. Uh, and I looked at her and I said, but you don't, I do. <laughs> and I think there's the point. These houses were built for us specifically. It wasn't built for anybody else. What is delightful is that other people enjoy being here too. And it's very nice to share it with you. Yeah, thank you, Patty. It'd be really nice to have a quick go and see around just around this front side of the house if you've got a moment. Yeah, sure. So I find that really interesting, Patty, because you're talking about that basically your family were the client and this was built for your needs. Yes. Specifically, and that's very much what that experience of um, working with an architect is about, is about having your needs met. It might not be for everyone. Um, but also that people can come here and absolutely enjoy this as a piece of architecture, so um, which is wonderful. And for us, it's such a you know, an honour um, and a treat to be able to show it. 
I uh, I think that's a really interesting question because I think good architecture serves your needs and does it beautifully. It enhances your life. That's what good and that's what all good architects can do. We do have some. honestly that in the intention of most architects is to improve the quality of people's lives. What does great architecture do? Uh, and there's a real question because I think undoubtedly this is. You know, it, it doesn't age. Uh, people are still coming to see it uh, all these years later. Uh, I think great architecture, A, enhances your life as good architecture does, but B, leaves you with questions. And I think that's what people enjoy so much when they come in. Apart from the beautiful views and the extraordinary things, it actually asks you questions. It says, what is a city? Because you look out on the city as if you're an, observ an objective observer uh, looking from, from the gods, from the heights. Um, and if it leaves you with questions, it's like great art. Great art leaves you with questions too. You know? What is Picasso trying to get over here? And I think the fact that at first glance, people seem to empathise with this building, but they don't always totally understand it. And then ask questions, buildings that ask questions never get boring. Mm. And I also think that the stories, you know, and uh, this is like this beautiful opportunity for someone to understand the building. It's having you show us through it. It's hearing the stories about your father and your family um, that give us a, that sort of deeper connection or understanding to the to the building and, and the architect and yeah. its process. Yeah, he did some interesting things up here. We.